I'd like to introduce our three panelists in the order in which they will be presenting. Together, they will engage in a discussion on healing and mission, the majority world's response. You can learn more about them along with all of our program participants in the speakers section of the Whova app. We have with us today, Dr. Apoko Onanina. Dr. Apoko Onanina is an associate professor of Pentecostal studies at Pentecost University in Accra, Ghana. He holds a PhD in theology from the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. He is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of Ghana National Cathedral and president of the Bible Society of Ghana. He also serves as a member of the Christian Unity Commission of Pentecostal World Fellowship, co-chair of the African Pentecostal Mission, and co-chair of Empowered 21 Scholars Consultation. In addition, he is a member of the Commission of World Mission and Evangelism of the World Council of Churches. Also joining us is Dr. Elizabeth Salazar Sanzana. Elizabeth Salazar Sanzana serves as professor of evangelical theology at the CTE of Chile and for the graduate programs in Semisud, U. Lee University, Biblia Virtual, and Fiat in Argentina. She also is director of educational and theological services for Latin America for Redis Chile. Dr. Salazar Sanzana has been the General Secretary of the Andes region of the Latin American Council of Churches and is currently the coordinator of the Program for Christian Responsibility and the Environment for Clay Numa. She received her PhD in theology and history from the Methodist University in Sao Paulo, Brazil and has completed additional studies in education at the University of the Republic of Chile, theological curriculum, gender, and hermeneutics at the Basi Institute, Switzerland, and theological deepening at the Advanced School of Theology of IECLB in Sao Leopoldo, Brazil. Finally, we have Dr. Sung Duk Oak, Dr. Oak is the Dong Soon Im and Mija Im Endowed Chair and Associate Professor of Korean Christianity at the University of California, Los Angeles. He first joined UCLA Center for Korean Studies in 2002 as a Henry Luce Postdoctoral Fellow of Korean Christianity. His fields of expertise include the history of Korean Christianity, and its East Asian and global connections, especially interactions between Christianity and Korean religion, religious culture in the socio-political context. One of his monographs, The Making of Korean Christianity, Encounters of Protestantism with Korean Religions, 1876 to 1915, the first volume of the series of the studies in world Christianity, was awarded the Book of the Year by Books and Culture in 2013. Currently, he is writing the History of the Korean Bible Society, Volume 3, 1945 to 2000. We're grateful to have them all with us today so they can now begin their discussion with presentations. Dr. Onina. Praise God. I bring you greetings from Pentecost University, Ghana. We want to thank the Lord God Almighty for giving us the privilege of interacting with you. I'm speaking on the topic, healing and missions. The majority words response. Africans perspective of the role of the church in health and healing. When Africans are talking about the power of God to heal, we are not necessarily talking about the power of God to heal because of the African cultures. No, but the Africans read the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, and see the hand of God in healing. We, for instance, in the Old Testament, we see 
Naaman being healed of leprosy, uh, Sarah, Hannah being healed of barrenness. If you come to the New Testament, we see the workings of the Lord Jesus Christ and also those of the apostles. So these inform us. However, the healing uh, ministry of the churches in Africa, as it is now, have grown uh, from various stages and now has come to a, a situation where we've settled at healing and deliverance. Now, with the healing and deliverance, it started from somewhere else. It has come through various phases, and I want us to handle the phases. The first phase I'll talk about is the traditional, uh, African traditional religious practices. When you come to African tradition, we have various practices, and Africa has got many cultures, but at, at least there are some similarities, commonalities, that various anthropologists who have worked and missiologists who have worked in Africa have come out with some um, similarities. Most of the cultures in Africa believe in the spirit beings controlling the affairs of issues. The supreme being being the supreme one, and then underneath the supreme being are the deities, the gods, who also are very much interested in what is going on among humanities. And that if someone falls sick, the sickness could be a, a breaking of a taboo or offending a deity or even offending one another. So formally, every adult was expected to know some herbs. When somebody was sick, the adult was supposed to minister the herbs to that person. If after the ministration of the herbs, nothing happens, then the person will seek the help of a spiritual person. That spiritual person could be a traditional priest. He could be a, a divine uh, healer. Um, some people called, uh, some time ago, they called them witch doctors. You may call them sorcerers. But they would have to visit a spiritual person who would have to find the cause of the disease. Now, if that spiritual person is consulted and is able to diagnose and find out the cause of the disease, then he will begin to minister, he or she, because the spiritual person could be a woman or a man. It could be both male and female. And most of the traditional uh, priests were priestesses who were actually administering these sort of herbs to the people. Now, when the priest was able to diagnose and find out the type of medicine that would be effective, he would have to murmur, offer some prayers quietly on the medication before administering it. It is this type of murmuring, offering prayer on the medication given to people that later on became a source of problem for many Christians in Africa, especially the Pentecostal charismatic groups. Now, the traditional priest would have to accept the person at his or her shrine. So the shrine became something like a center where people would have to gather there for their hearing to take place. So after this one came the advent of Christianity. And of course, the missionaries did very well by bringing in medical uh, services to the people. And in many places, you would realize that it is the health centers of the missionaries that still remain. And therefore, the administration of the medical services, scientific one, was very helpful to people. However, the Africans wanted something more than that, especially if someone was sick and went to the hospital or in a clinic and a person was not healed, then whether the person is a Christian or not, sometimes they will sneak and consult the traditional priest or the diviner to find out the causation of the problem. So this sort of finding out, which I call divinity consultation, became very important within the various African cultures. 
Now, it was from this perspective that the African independent or African initiated churches emerged. And when they emerged, they became very, very popular because they claim power and they claim power to heal. And in their process of healing, they had to admit people even to their churches. So some sort of prayer centers and camps were set up and people had to go there for prayer. They combined the biblical type of praying, the sort of commanding in the gospels that they, 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 they read about Jesus Christ. And then the traditional type of also admitting people at their, their camps. Now, when Herod Turner was talking in the 60s, he was saying that in many of the African cultures, they will use oil, they will use handkerchiefs, uh, bless water, uh, bless handkerchief, uh, uh, handkerchiefs and things of that nature. But they were not using herbs. However, in West Africa, herbs were being ministered by some of the African initiated churches. But many things worked against them. Some, some elite, in quote, people found it uncomfortable to visit their shrines publicly or their camps publicly. So they would have to sneak in and visit there. And then were, there were some questions that were uh, raised against the leadership. Therefore, when the Pentecostal type of Christianity came on scene, many people embraced them because of what they were doing, Pentecostal Christianity. And many people thought that it was quite polished than the African initiated churches. And because some structures had been settled, many people thought it was safe running to them. But there is something about the classical Pentecostals that we need to bring out. You know, during the 1918, uh, 19 uh, influenza pandemic, many people flocked to the churches that were around. And by this time, uh, there was a church in the United States of America, Faith a Tabernacle Congregation, that had, through their magazines, Sword of the Spirit, contacted some people in West Africa especially. And um, when they contacted them, they preached about divine healing without any recourse to medicine, whether scientific medicine or help. And some people bought it. Some people said that they prayed and got healed. And these people, the faith and the tabernacle people had wanted to visit their churches in West Africa during the pandemic. But because of their faith, they did not take the vaccine that would allow them to visit West Africa and other parts. Therefore, such people got connected with the Apostolic Church of UK Bradford, uh, specifically at that time, and they were able to break through. So when they came back, they were able to take over some of these churches, but the doctrine of divine healing without recourse to any medicine had been established. And this sort of teaching, though it was against many African cultures, influenced some people and brought divisions uh, among the Pentecostal type of Christianity. So that was another issue that brought some sort of division among Pentecostals. Now, during the Pentecostal sort of healing and other things, which were also similar to the African initiated churches with the assumption of initially there were no uh, um, uh, healing aids like water. There were no healing aids like water at all. So the Pentecostals did this straight away. But after the Pentecostals came the charismatic sort of Christianity and they brought the awareness of demons, witchcraft and, and curses. And through their teachings, Many people, many African Christians thought that because of the, the worship of the gods from our ancestors, every African Christian would need deliverance. So as they promoted deliverance, almost all the churches were able to 
buy into healing and deliverance. And healing and deliverance has currently become the ministry of health services in many of the churches, not neglecting the scientific one. The churches still go into hospitals and clinics, but healing and deliverance has become part or an important part of the health ministry of the church in Africa. Now, if a church does not establish a healing and deliverance group, prayer warrior or center, that church may not get many members. Therefore, Catholics, other evangelical churches and Pentecostals are doing that. But because of the democratization of charisma, individuals have come in and there has been a complete abuse, very, very abuse of the system. And um, Yep, so that is the abuse um, uh, that is going on. You can, you can stop it. You can uh, stop it. So although the church has entered into this deliverance ministry and uh, some people are uh, taking it, majority are enjoying it, there are many, many challenges about it. If you want to evaluate the deliverance ministry, the healing and deliverance ministry that is going on, you see that it is a combination or a mixture of a wide range of practices. The traditional ones, the one from the African in initiated uh, churches, the biblical approach. You can also see a psychological approach and a lot of prayer uh, languages are used, blood, blood, blood. When you bring all together, you realize that the Africans would need to evaluate what is going on very, very well and look ahead. One Swedish Tanzania church historian and missiologist, Bent Sunkula, said something that African Christians will need to consider when he researched about the AIC, Africa Initiated Churches. He said, in these churches, one will be able to see what the African Christian, when left to himself, regarded as important and relevant in the Christian faith and church. So if what Africans regard as important is this healing and deliverance ministry, then I recommend that we should take cue from COVID-19. During COVID period, you could not touch somebody. You could not push somebody. And people still preach to others. So the church would have to refine our healing ministries. And church leaders would have to bring it to the core of the liturgy. And then theological institutions would also have to include it in our curriculum because it is very, very important. And once it comes within the main structure, the church may be able to control the excesses that come in healing and deliverance. So it is my prayer that African Christians would take these recommendations into consideration and refine our healing and deliverance ministry. God bless you. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mis disculpas por hablarle en mi lengua. I would like to apologize for speaking my own language. Pero vamos a tratar de trabajar juntos el tema. But we will try to work this issue together. Jesús lloró. Jesus cried. Pero fue por el único que lloró. But it was the only one in which he wept. ¿En cuántos momentos usted identifica la empatía de Jesús por los necesitados que le rodeaban? In how many moments do you identify Jesus' empathy for those in need around him? El Evangelio de Jesucristo nos rodea y nos conduce a la esencia misma de Dios, el amor. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ leads us to the very essence of God, love. Nos lleva a la consideración de ser en su integralidad como creación y en la sensibilidad del contexto. It leads us to the consideration of being in its integrality as creation in the sensitivity of the context. A los que somos vulnerables, ¿qué nos preparó para esta desgracia de la pandemia? Who, those who are vulnerable, vulnerable, who prepared us for this pandemic. Debemos repasar lo que Jesús nos quiso transmitir como sus seguidores, seguidoras, al salvar y sanar como una obra conjunta. We must review what Jesus wanted to convey to us as his followers by saving and healing as a joint work. En esta presentación quiero trabajar la necesidad expectante en la que el Espíritu de Dios nos enseña a ser y estar como parte de la salud y vida en abundancia que nos ha entregado. In this presentation, I want to work on the expectant need in which the Spirit of God teaches us to be and to be as part of the health and life in abundance that he has given us. Primero, la espiritualidad para sanidad. First, spirituality for healing. Es difícil convivir entre los deseos de progreso y la actual situación medioambiental. It is difficult to live between the desire of progress and the current environmental situation. Las patologías y trastornos son múltiples y se buscan soluciones drásticas, arbitrarias, que no consideran la totalidad o raíz del problema. The pathologies and disorders are multiple and drastic. Arbitrary solutions are a threat, which do not consider the totality of root of the problem. Frente a esta realidad de muerte, porque es de muerte, ¿qué significa salvación? ¿Qué significa sanidad? Face on this reality of death, what does salvation mean? What does healing mean? Partimos de la premisa que la sanidad y la restauración son parte integral, integral a todo nivel en la vida. We start from the premise that health and restoration are an integral part of life at every level. Pero miramos más allá y desafiamos la visión holística ante las males sociales y el sistema. But we look further and challenge the holistic vision in the face of social ills and systemic environmental degradation. Disculpe, estaba eh, equivocada. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Creo que me perdí. Quiero trabajar con ustedes. I would like to work with you. Un punto fundamental. An essential point. Miramos más allá, desafiamos la visión holística de los males sociales y, y la degradación del medio ambiente, como les dije. Pero necesitamos, pe we need, mm, necesitamos pensar en este llamado a la reconciliación. Necesitamos pensar en este llamado de Jesucristo con su creación. Sanidad y restauración en la que los primeros seguidores reconocieron tener solo lo que el Señor les dio, ni plata ni oro. We need to think about this call to reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ and with his creation, healing and restoration, in which the first followers acknowledged having only what they received from the Lord since they had no silver or gold. Cuando se habla de espiritualidad, el discurso se concentra en una parte de la iglesia, la cual, según el testimonio bíblico, es santificada por el Espíritu. Y por otra parte, en la intimidad del Espíritu Santo que vive y hace templo en cada uno de nosotros. When speaking of spirituality, 
the discourse focuses on, the hand, on one hand on the church, which according to biblical testimony is sanctified by spirit, and on the other hand, on the intimacy of Holy Spirit who lives, makes a temple in us. La reflexión sobre la pandemia, nuestra actual necesidad de sanidad de las naciones y la necesidad más sentida de nuevas eclesiologías, de comunidades justas e inclusivas, nos permite reconocer principios como claves para la tarea reflexiva neumatológica. Reflection on the pandemic, our current need of the health of nations and the most felt need in new ecclesiologies for just and inclusive communities allow us to recognize principle as keys to the reflective nomatological task. Dinámico. Dynamism. Diversidad y armonía. Diversity and harmony. Justicia y transformación. Justice and transformation. No da el tiempo para ver cada uno. There is not enough time to see each one of them. Pero diremos algo. But we will tell some things. ¿Por qué dinámico? Why is it dynamic? Entre el silbo apacible y el viento recio. Between the gentle whistle and the strong wind. En, esa, en ese dinamismo nos encontramos con el poder gestador manifestado en el vientre de la joven María. Al mismo tiempo, el susurro imperativo y firme que le habla a José para que se sume al proyecto de Dios. In this gestation of power manifested in the womb of young Mary, and it is at the same time the imperative and firm whisper that speaks to Joseph so that they may join the project of God. Ese espíritu melodioso y disruptivo que se revela en medio de la noche a los pastores y guía a los sabios. He is also the melodious and disruptive spirit who reveals himself to the shepherds in the middle of the night and guides like a star some wise men. Soplo y viento recio. Breath and strong wind. En este dinamismo rompe la individualidad y nos ubica en relación con todo lo que nos rodea. In this dynamism, it breaks the individuality and places us in relation to everything that surrounds us. Trae nuevo sentido a nuestra realidad. El relato de Pedro y Cornelio, que nos muestra un Pentecostés a las afueras del centro de poder. The story of Peter and Cornelius brings us new meaning to our reality which show us a Pentecost outside the center of power. Diversidad y armonía. Diversity and harmony. Dios en su libertad nos hace considerar su diversidad. El multiforme ministerio cristiano se visualiza justamente en este hecho puntual que involucra a todos y revela la diversidad del cuerpo de Cristo. God, in his freedom, makes us consider his diversity. The multiform Christian ministry is visualized precisely in this central fact, which involves everyone and reveals the diversity of being a body of Christ. An integral action must bring together the diverse and complementary elements, apparently contradictory, that make up the revealed mystery. La globalización asevera una diversidad nefasta, pues nos ubica en asimetrías, en que la equidad en derechos los, no se plasma con el Evangelio, como lo, el Evangelio lo declara. Globalization asserts a disastrous diversity, since it plays us in asymmetries, in which equity in rights is not reflected in the gospel declares. El individualismo tan dañino para las relaciones sociales ataca los afectos, la ternura y destruye la sociedad, 
desde sus bases. Se va perdiendo esta afectuosidad. Individualism, so harmful to social relationships, attacks affections, tenderness, and destroys society from the spaces. That affection that helps us to recognize ourselves with our neighbor, to think of ourselves in relationship to the others, is being lost. Tercer punto, justicia. Third aspect, justice. Algo de América Latina. Something from Latin America. Néstor Miguel menciona que la justicia se logra con la reciprocidad. Y no es una idea abstracta de igualdad en el sentido en que lo podríamos equiparar a la justicia con el igualitarismo, sino que más bien es una actividad en la que podemos esperar que nuestra conducta va a corresponder a la otra parte, aún teniendo en cuenta diferencias. Mr. Miguel mentions that justice is achieved with reciprocity and it is not an abstract idea of equality in the sense that we could equate justice with egalitarianism, but rather it is an activity in which we can expect that our behavior will correspond to that of another party, even talking in taking into account the differences. Recordemos, lo que procuran la paz, lo que los que procuramos la paz, sembramos, sembramos en pras frutos de justicia. Remember, those who seek peace, sow in peace fruits of justice. Uno de los temas cruciales para mí es la justicia de género. One of the crucial issues for me is gender justice. Lo mismo sucede desde el adultocentrismo y niñez. The same happens from the adult centrism and childhood. Abrazar la justicia es considerar las relaciones sociales de poder que han llevado a la misión a sembrar injusticia. Uh, to embrace justice is to consider the social relation of power that have led us mission to sow injustice. También hablar de transformación. We also need to talk about transformation. Esto voy a solamente men mencionarlo. I will just mention this. Hacemos la thinking. Los jóvenes hablan de cambio de actitud como el pararse de nuevo en el mundo. Y me gusta esa imagen. Es lo que dijo Jesús de nacer de nuevo y por eso transformación para mí es eso. Young people talk about change of attitude and standing again in the world. And I like this image more. It is what Jesus said to Nicodemus, to be born again, that sums up the gospel of good news and our Lord Jesus Christ impelled in the divine breath. Cuando hablamos de salud, el desafío de ser comunidades sanadoras ha sido asumido espontáneamente. The challenge of being healing communities has been assumed spontaneously. Aunque el ser embajadores del evangelio de salvación y sanidad ha llevado a las iglesias a crear espacios terapéuticos y esto ya se ha hablado. Although by being ambassadors of the gospel of salvation and healing, it has led to church to create therapeutic spaces that we have treated. Veamos la salud como un ofrecimiento de gracia. Let's see health as an offering of grace. Como el, el ciego Bartimeo, que no solo fue recuperado de su ceguez, sino volvió a ser digno. Like Rembrandt Bright to Mills, who was not only recovered from his blindness, but once again dignified with a voice and social space. Salud como bienestar humano integral. Health as integral human well-being. Vivimos en una época en que queremos respuestas rápidas y con frecuencia hay teologías 
que responden a eso. We live in a time when we want quick answers and often there are theologies that help them to respond to this. Pasó a la otra. A partir de esto proponemos a la luz de lo que planteamos que la misión es restauración de la vida, pero integralmente. From this, we propose, in the light of what we pur propose, that the mission is the restoration of life integrally. Y esto significa, esta restauración de salud no siempre está concretizada en que el no vidente vea o el sordo oiga y hable, pues los misterios de Dios tienen que ver en una restauración que se concretiza en la calidad de vida y en manera de integrarse con sus capacidades o capacidades diferenciadas al proyecto de Dios. This restoration of health is not always concretized in that the blind sees or the deaf hear and speak since the, mystery of, since, since the mysteries of God have to do in a restoration that is concretized in quality of life and in the way of integrating with their capacities to God's project. La presentación es bastante extensa presentation it's quite long pero quiero partir diciéndole but i would like to begin telling you que mi propuesta es ver la salud como buen vivir that my proposal is to see health as a way uh, as a way of living as a good living queremos hacer entender esto We want to make this understood. Sin duda es una resignificación conceptual. With, without any doubt, it's conceptual resignifications. Y significa también incorporar los conceptos del buen vivir de los pueblos originarios. And it also implies integrating the good living aspects from a native's Uh, people. Es una restauración holística. It is an holistic restoration. Y en conclusión, and in conclusion, para mí en el ámbito, for me, de la sanidad, in terms of sanity, es health. fundamental, it is essential, reincorporar, to reincorporate la concepción del cuerpo, the conception of the body, y el buen vivir, and good living, junto con el buen morir, together with the good dying, elementos que en el evangelio, which are elements that in the gospel, sí, de alguna manera, somehow, lo hemos olvidado. We have forgotten it. Somos vulnerables. We are vulnerable. Y la muerte. And death. En dignidad. In dignity. Y la enfermedad. Disease. En dignidad. In dignity. Es lo que el Evangelio vino a entregarnos. Is what both the gospel came to teach us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi everybody. Uh, this is a Korean church's experience for the first 50 years. So I pre-recorded my talk to save us time. After a century of medical work in Asia and Africa, medical work started in Korea from 1880s when the germ theory developed. A new findings of bacteriology promoted Medical Sorry, missions I need to in the world again. And then the medical missions. In it has three parts. First, changing ideas of medical mission from a tool for evangelism to an expression of Christian love. Second, the epidemics and medical missions. The third, colonization of medical missions. After a century of medical work in Asia and Africa, medical work started in Korea from 1880s when the germ theory developed. A new findings of bacteriology promoted medical missions in the world. 
And then international wars, the Sino-Japanese war and Russo-Japanese war, the epidemics of cholera gave opportunity to the medical mission in Korea. Changing ideas of medical mission. Medical mission was understood as a tool for evangelism at the turn of the 20th century. There were different models in East Asia. In China, a few local governments hired medical missionaries to open hospitals, and missions had local mission hospitals. In Japan, most of the hospitals were operated by the government, and there was no mission hospital around 1900. By contrast, in Korea, the central government hired Protestant medical missionaries to open a government hospital in Seoul, and missions tried to change this one into a mission hospital. So there was a hospital question started in 1900 by Dr. Evison in Seoul. He tried to establish a large and modern institution based on interdenominational cooperation. However, Dr. Wells in Pyongyang and other medical missionaries emphasized one-man hospital for evangelism. Korea was open to the Protestant missions by the surgeons' Lancet. The Progressive Party made a Kapshin coup d'etat in December 1884, and Min Young-hwan was severely wounded. Dr. Arlen rescued him. King go allowed to open the government hospital in April 1885. The head was Dr. Allen. However, no much investment was given to the medical missions until 1904 because medical mission was regarded as a way to open the evangelistic mission. And the evangelistic mission in Korea was opened very easily and rapidly than expected. So female doctors and nurses primarily engaged in evangelism. The Royal Hospital in Seoul was a contesting place between the Korean government and the Korean mission and among foreign powers because it was the government hospital and the head doctor was the king's physician in a high rank. It was a powerful position. The president mission adopted the Nebius method as official mission policy in 1891, but the medical missionaries Ellen Heron shifted to the civilization theory, and then Mr. Underwood revised his position from Nebius method to the civilization theory. And in 1890s, Dr. Evison and Mr. Underwood in Seoul strengthened the civilization theory. By contrast, in Pyongyang, Muppet Baird Lee, they emphasized the Nebius method and Christ only theory. As the Jeju was the government hospital, many countries, world powers, had eyes on it, and the United States wanted to maintain the medical hegemony in Korea. And Dr. Evison and Mr. Underwood wanted to make Jeju a semi-mission hospital from a government hospital. So a new contract was made in 1894 between the Korean government and Dr. Evison. The hospital became a semi-mission hospital where moderate religious activities were allowed, and no government officials were appointed, and Dr. Evison supervised the hospital. Such a change was justified when Korea hit Seoul in 1894. Two Korea shelters were operated by Christian missionaries. One outside of the East Gate, the other outside of the West Gate. And Korean Christians of Semonan Church served at the West Gate shelter. The result was enhanced status of Christian medical missions, and it justified the transfer of Jeju-1 to the Presbyterian mission. The second controversy over Severance Hospital from 1900. Dr. Davidson made an address at the Ecumenical Missionary Conference in New York in 1900 about the Union Hospital. And Mr. Severance donated a lot of money. So Dr. Wells in Pyongyang opposed such a institutionalism based on the Navy's method and spirituality. The hospital question, controversy between institutionalism and the Navy's method, the large modern institution with more than two doctors or one man hospital competed each other and the consequences was the revision of the Navy's method in Seoul and two method uh, institutionalism and the Navius method coexisted between Seoul and Pyongyang. The second major debate happened in 1920s. This was the contest between Japanese government and Protestant missions. They had different vision for kingdoms. Japanese government controlled the medical work and hygiene by the police and promoted public health to produce healthy royal subjects of the empire. By contrast, the Protestant medical missions promoted the kingdom of God and different ideas of medicine. Therefore, the Japanese colonial government had an oppressive regulations against the Protestant medical missionaries. 
many conductors needed to take an exam in Tokyo to get a license. And most of the midwives and nurses were Japanese who spoke only Japanese language. When Korean students of the Severance Medical School did not need an exam for license from 1923, it was just in case the department chairs were Japanese. Japanese government established many charity hospitals at the centers of the provinces. In 1924, missions had 27 hospitals with 40 physicians, mostly one-man hospitals. However, they treated a lot of patients for free. So 40% were charity work. That's why the controversy happened over the role of the mission hospitals against the colonial government hospitals and for the charity work. Therefore, in 1923, the New York Board suggested the medical mission in Korea should be abandoned because of charity work was done by the government, a lot of new regulations and financial shortage of the mission. In 1924, the Korea Medical Missionary Association debated. The issue was extinguish or expand. And the question was how to defend the medical mission. Dr. James Webster in Manchuria suggested a new idea of medical mission in 1907 as an integral part of mission, it should be permanent and essential, not dispensable, based on the great command, Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor as yourself. Instead of the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Dr. Webster refuted two misconceptions. Their evangelical viewpoint regarded medical mission as inessential. So when pioneering role disappeared, missions conducted without medical missions. By contrast, the Japanese model, broader secular one, regarded medical mission as propagandist. So medicine could be conducted without mission, philanthropic and humanitarian approach. That was 1910s and 20s Japanese model. So the medical mission is in Korea, but that is the third view. Medical mission is the integral part of Christianity. It's a revelation of the kingdom of God and ministry of healing and love are parts of the kingdom of God. And medical mission is love by deed. And the rethinking missions in 1932 checked situations in India, China, and Japan, and they found that the increase of the government role in medical missions. And there was no space in Korea. So major issue was the relationship between medical missions and the governments in East Asia. In Japan, medical mission abandoned in 1920s. In China, still it was important, but in Korea, it was in crisis because of the increase of the role of government hospital. Rethinking mission in 1932 justified the medical mission's objective for its own sake. In the Christian medical program, like preventive medicine, nursing, education, various forms of welfare work, for public health was emphasized, and the principles of medical mission was the service rendered in love, disinterested belief. New idea of medical mission in Korea was proposed by Dr. Wire, Dr. Sharox, and Dr. Charles McNaren. Dr. McNaren, an Australian medical missionary, he was influenced by the theology of Abraham Kuyper, not the square inch, and he, the idea of medical mission was an incarnational mission. So in the late 1910s, medical mission was defined as holistic part of Christianity, a practice of Christian love, an exponent of Christianity, and ministry of healing. And they say the true motive of medical mission is love. The MOT conference was held in Seoul in 1925. It discussed the mission work for the young people and the poor Koreans. So medical mission should be expanded for the changing situation. But because of the Great Depression in 1929, medical missionary work was reduced in 1930s. And the double system with the union hospitals and one men's hospital continued. This is the second part, the jump theory. It transformed the group communion into the individual communion. It started in the United States in 1891, and the Korean church adopted the individual communion pointed cops from 1913. So we can say medical science and pandemics have changed the Christian liturgy and theology. 
The second issue is the governmental order of closing the churches. During the cholera epidemic in 1899, the Korean government prohibited all group meetings, including religious meetings. And then in 1910-11, Manchurian plague shut down the borderline between China and Korea, and the Korean people were controlled by colonial police hygiene. In 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic made the church closed in the United States, but not in Korea, and the Korean church had no response at all. Today's massacre emerged during the Manchurian plague in 1910. This is a map of the Manchurian plague in 1911. It killed 60,000 people in Manchuria in five months. The disease was similar to today's COVID-19, and it spread out quickly following the railroad during the winter. It had not crossed the Yalu River. The Japanese government boasted of the victory of the Japanese medical civilization and police control. The Spanish flu and Korean Christianity in 1918 to 1919, 8 million cases happened in Korea and 100,000 died. No vaccine yet, and the massacre introduced for the first time. The Korean churches continued their worship service. However, they kept silence on the issue. Only one good response done by Dr. Scarfield at Severance he published a, a medical paper on pandemic influenza in Korea with a special reference to its etiology in 1919. When some demon-possessed cases exercised by Christian missionaries and Chinese and Korean Christians, the debate about demon possession and mental illness started from 1880, and the germ theory has some relationship with this issue. Seoul missionaries, like uh, under the Appendix Law, held cessationism, but Pyongyang missionaries and Kim Ik Do, revivalist, made some miraculous healing and exorcism. And there was a middle position by Mappet, Gilsonju, Gale, and Clark. In the 1920s and 30s, Dr. Charles McLaren of Severance Hospital, of Australian Presbyterian Mission, he was the only missionary psychiatrist in Korea up to 1930s. And his position was a chemical therapy should be employed, but uh, mental illness or demon possession is not just a, a psychological and chemical issue, but moral and spiritual issue. So he had empathy toward the insane people under the colonial rule, poverty, prejudice, and superstition. So he emphasized the holistic approach, mental, moral, spiritual healing. So he debated a lot about the relationship between medical science and Christian faith. So he tried to integrate these two spheres. And he said, true insanity is often or always an affair of the spirit. That the issue are spiritual issues, fear and pride, and unwillingness to have the truth. Science demonstrates the scientific method it is practical. It interprets that healing comes from God and it's a theological. So mental illness comes from abnormal social context and uh, also faith and trust. So he was influenced by Carl Jung's idea. Dr. McLaren thought demon possession is mental illness. It needs spiritual healing like prayer. The third part, Koreanization. It means not just the, the production of Korean doctors and nurses, but also missionary engagement, social engagement, and political engagement. Korean medical doctors and nurses participate in foreign missionary work in China and Manchuria and Siberia. And they participate in the March 1st movement in 1919 and independence movement in Manchuria, China, and Siberia from 1910. So Korean doctors and Korean nurses. And then from 1928, Korean female doctors were produced by the missions. Let me conclude this talk by mentioning some main issues. First, the church-state relationship between the governmental hospitals and mission hospitals. Second issue is the evangelism and medicine. Medical mission is a fruit or a fruit of Christian missions. Three, what is a mission? Medical mission is the integral part of the Christian mission. 
for medical science and faith. Mental illness is chemical, psychological, moral, and spiritual issue. We need an integrated approach by Korean agency. Korean agency means missionary and social and political engagement for the kingdom of God. Thank you. The contesting ideas of the medical missions. In Thank you very much, Dr. Oak. So now we're going to be shifting to the question and answer time. We've got a number of questions. The first one is for Dr. Oniena, um, and then we'll have questions for the whole panel. For question one, most of the majority world associate healing with a religious leader or symbol from their culture, a temple, witch doctor, priest. Does the Christian practice of healing have to present Jesus as a type of religious leader to the African, or ought he be pre-presented not just as a replacement of the old traditional religious leader, but something different or more than this tradition? Not hearing you. Go to the Bible. Can you hear now? Yes, thank you. When Christians go back to the Bible, Christian healing practices become different from the traditional ones. Getting to the traditional type of healing is not evil as such, if only the ethics are good. But so far as you keep on pushing people, you keep on maybe using a chair uh, to, to heal somebody, then you are going overboard. So Christians should go back to simple command in the name of Jesus. When there is opportunity to touch, you will touch the person without pushing, without any sort of abuse. So once we use the biblical principles, we are back to the basis, and that will bring difference between the healing practices of the Christians and those of um, traditional priests, diviners, or whatever you call them. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that response. I'm gonna move on to question number two. This is for the whole panel. Is it possible that healing and de deliverance are thriving in majority world contexts because hospitals and medical practice is not advanced enough to answer the increasingly complex health challenge that is currently being faced? Yeah, there was always the contest between the traditional healing practice and uh, so-called uh, Western style Christian uh, medical science. Uh, that's why a lot of uh, you know, debate there, uh, and still uh, a lot of Koreans practice a traditional way of healing, and Pe Pentecostal Church uh, accommodated that one, uh, as uh, Dr. Onia, Onia, Onia Na said. Um, but uh, gradually, uh, you know, the Western style uh, uh, healing increased, and uh, the government control, of course, uh, increased a lot. Um, and the uh, Christian medical missions accommodated the changing situations and, and updated or, or modernized. Uh, uh, and that at the same time, there is the third tradition, traditional uh, Confucian Taoist tradition there. And that developed into so-called Korean traditional uh, healing method. Uh, uh, so th these three uh, uh, practices competing each other, but of course, uh, like uh, in, in Japan, uh, more than 90, uh, 95 percent that's uh, the Western style practice uh, dominates, and and Korean society also you know, uh, modernized. So this is the mainline practice, mm -hmm. and, and the Christian Christianity or Protestantism follow this uh, modern style one. Las iglesias pentecostales en Chile. En Chile, pentecostal churches hicieron un puente. Made a sort of bridge entre las tradiciones de los pueblos originarios. Between native tradition medicine y la población and population carente, who were lacked, pobre, who were que llegaba a las iglesias, uh, who arrived to churches. El uso de la medicina the, alternativa. The use of alternative medicine 
las hojas, the leaves, eh, de los árboles, from the trees, la miel, uh, honey, el agua, water, todo eran elementos, all of those were elements, que fueron incorporados, which were added, pero por el pentecostalismo, by pentecostalism, como una expresión religiosa, as a religion expression, que incorporaba con afecto, which added with affect, la sabiduría uh, ancestral, the ancestors, uh, sí. sabiduría, sabiduría, memoria, memory, sí. traditions, sí. Mal mirado por los misioneros, which was not well seen by the missionaries, pero la gente lo hacía. No, but people did it. When did that happen historically? Can you give us a little bit of historical context for that? Hay un contexto histórico para eso? Yes. Sí. El es parte de eh, it's part de mi investigación from, de doctorado. From my investigation uh, Do mm. de doctorado, de la tesis doctoral. My tesis. Y eso es en los años 40. And that dates from the 1940s con eh, la gente que venía del campo with the people coming from the farms que se desplazaba hacia la ciudad who moved to the cities entre esos mis padres beyond <laughs> them my parents mm. um, there is no doubt that lack of enough medical services would cause people to go to these prayer centers camps and run for healing However, we've had instances where people come from the West, uh, where medical facilities are enough, yet come back and go to these prayer centers. So the belief that there is something behind what is happening is also very prevalent and strong in the minds of, of the African people. That drives many to go to these centers. Wonderful. Let's move on to question number three. Um, I'm going to have this addressed to the whole panel. Um, what's been the response of the church to COVID in your different contexts? Creo que las iglesias, I think churches, eh, en su diversidad, in their diversity, han podido responder, have been able to answer con los recursos que tienen, with their resources. Sin embargo, although estamos siempre frente, we're always in front a movimientos of eh, fundamentalistas, fundamentalist movements, que llevan a la población which takes population a actuar irresponsablemente to act in an irresponsible way pero las iglesias the churches han resistido have resisted y aunque nos dijeron and although they told us los estudios sociológicos according to sociological studies que éramos pastor centrico that we were pastor centric que éramos templo céntrico, that we were centered on temples, llevamos muchos meses resistiendo, we spent a lot of uh, months resisting, con afectividad, with affection, virtual, virtual <laughs> affection, y estamos resistiendo, and we are still resisting. Any other comments on COVID uh, response? Otherwise, we'll go on to the next question. Um, I, I was speaking to it. When you come to Ghana, for instance, um, the churches really assisted the government during the COVID period. For instance, um, the churches had to educate people on preventive measures, washing your hands under running water, uh, using soap, of course, at least uh, putting on your masks, and uh, using sanitizer. 
And um, the Church of Pentecost, for instance, had to give our convention center, uh, which happens to be the largest in the country, to the government as isolation center. So the churches really cooperated with the government to combat the COVID. In case of Korea, there was a lot of scandals for some churches, mm -hmm. fundamentalist day, some charismatic churches, but basically churches uh, cooperate with the uh, government and uh, large churches uh, or mega churches have a lot of small churches. Uh, and COVID-19 experience reached the Korean churches what is the mission and what is church. And they debate a lot about, you know, uh, 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 what is church. Church uh, theology developed a lot during the COVID-19. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Well, we'll move on to question number four. Here's a theological question. Is it wrong to access traditional or herbal medication, especially now that witchcraft is associated with traditional healing? Um, traditional medicines are not necessarily wrong. Some of them are very effective. Um, as far back in the 50s, uh, some anthropologists were recommending some of the traditional uh, medicine. For instance, one Margaret Field said that watching how some of the traditional priests worked, she had no doubt that they could cure witchcraft. By that, she was, uh, she was referring to neurotic problems, people had mental problems. She thought that some of them had medicine for it. So traditional medicines are not wrong and we can use them. What makes some Christian think that is not wrong is when a diviner begins to offer prayers on it or mama something on it. That sort of process seems to mystify the, the medicine to the point that some Christians will think that that is not good. So if you go for the medicine, whether herbs, whether bark of trees, roots, or any other thing, and as a Christian, you pray on it and use it, there is nothing wrong with the medicine. I would like to share something. Cuando, eh, hice una investigación. I did a research. Una mujer sanó a su hijo con matico. A woman uh, healed uh, his son Ma with Ma a herb. A specific es, es, herb. Es una hoja. It's a leaf que usa los indígenas. Which is used by native people. Eso fue en los años 40. That was in the 40s, in the 1940s. Solamente en los años 80. Only in the 80s, la ciencia descubrió science discovered que es tremendamente cicatrizante. That it's a very good way for um, cicatrizing. Hoy, today, se vende crema de matico they sell matico cream en las farmacias at the drugstores very expensive muy caro and it's quite expensive entonces eh, cuando so es caro when something is expensive vendido en una farmacia and sold in a drugstore es válido it is valid y porque es de nuestro pueblo but in case it's from our no uh, es válido, ancestors, it's not valid. Fue el Espíritu Santo. It was the Holy Spirit que le habló a esa mujer, the one who talked to that woman, que le pusiera esas hojas. And asked he, her to put him those leaves. Entonces hay que hacer los análisis a partir de dónde está el poder. We have to analyze it according to the power. Nuestra sociedad, our society, tiene un concepto, has a concept muy, eh, muy eh, injusto, very unfair, con la sabiduría regarding uh, popular, traditional uh, knowledge. Y eso, and that, debemos cambiar. 
is something that must be changed. In, in Korea, during the colonial period, the herbal doctors fought against the Western medicine, Western style doctors. Today, there are a lot of Christian herbal doctors who uh, try to make balance between Western medicine and Eastern medicine or, or Korean medicine. So uh, even though it is called alternative uh, approach, but actually in Korea, this is uh, uh, one of the main line of medical science. So herbal medicine, medication, that's fine for the cultivation of one's vitality, but Western medicine is majorly for killing germs. You know that uh, you know diseases are an enemy. Enemies uh, killing is the method. But uh, traditional Chinese Korean studies cultivation once you know uh, inside the inner vitality. So we can need to keep these two methods you know, in balance. You know. Okay. Thank you for all your responses on that. I've. Got a question. Question five is directed to Dr. Solzana. Could you say more about good? This is actually a two part question. The first question Could you say more about good dying in light of pneumatological, spiritual, holistic practice of healing? And the second question How do you explain good living as healing or holistic health? Uh, how, ¿Cómo lo explicas? ¿Cómo explicas el buen vivir como una salación o una salud holística? Oh, Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Es, es justamente una necesidad que tenemos. It's a need we have por el evangelio. Uh, due to Para nosotros, For us, el morir es. Eh, en Cristo, dying in Christ, es ganancia. It's something that implies winning. Y a veces esto no lo consideramos. And sometimes we do not consider this. En su dimensión. In its dimension. Cuando hablamos de una un buen vivir, when we speak about a good living, intentamos incorporar, we try to add, lo que significa vivir en la fe cristiana. What means living in Christian faith? Pero la fe cristiana But Christian faith integra integrates en morir. Dying. Y de alguna manera And somehow lo hemos olvidado. We have forgotten it. Yo no estoy en contra de la medicina I'm not against medicine. estética. Or aesthetical. Me hace falta, seguramente. Maybe I need it. Pero creo, but I think, que es fundamental. That it is essential. Aprender a envejecer. To learn how to get old. Incorporar el morir. And adding dying. También como parte de nuestra finitud. As a part of our end. Y escatológicamente. And escatologically. El Evangelio nos prepara. Evangelion prefer us for it. Por eso para mí el buen That vivir, why, uh, good living, es también parte de ese it's also buen morir. Part from that good dying. Creo que hay mucho que eh, debemos aprender de I eso. I think there is a lot to learn about that issue. Thank you for your response. Question six is actually directed at Dr. Oak. Thank you for your nuanced presentation. Does your study of the politicization of medicine have anything to say to contemporary debates around COVID-19? Yeah, this is a tricky question. Uh, you know, in East Asia, always the government always try to control the religions, including medicine, education, and other activities. So that's the tradition in China, Korea, Japan, as you know. Uh, that's why I mentioned the relationship between government hospital and medical uh, mission hospital. 
And during the pandemic, especially germ theory, initially the mission used the germ theory to fight against the shamanistic uh, folk religious style of uh, you know, healing. But the government used the germ theory to control the missions, the mission hospitals during the pandemic and epidemics. So they had to close the churches from uh, late 19th centuries. Uh, that, the, the church was not so strong up to 1950s, 60s, the small Roman churches under the control of the you know, government, but now the church is huge power in South Korea. That's why they are fighting against the control of the church, the government. That's why uh, the so-called uh, church state issue or relation between the you know, uh, uh, religion and, and politics, that's a very tricky, complicated issue. And that's why some churches try to uh, maintain their so-called religious freedom against the control of the government. Uh, that's why, especially you know, uh, uh, so-called uh, conservative churches, right-wing churches, are fighting against so-called left-wing uh, government today. Uh, but, but generally speaking, uh, the politicization of this COVID-19 situation uh, uh, limited to some 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 small numbers of churches. Most of the churches are cooperating with the government. That's the tradition of East Asia, <laughs> under the control of the government. You know? Yeah. Thank you for your response. We have a final question. Um, we've got about three minutes or so left of question and answer. So here is the question to the panel. With reference to abuse in healing and deliverance practices, how have the church ecumenical councils advocated for government regulation of such religious practices? What are the roadblocks to regulating healing practices to minimize abuses? Well, when it comes to uh, abuses, some of the well-structured church, well churches are working very hard on addressing such issues. I'm aware of the Malagasy Lutheran Church, for instance. They would have to let such people go for training before they will be able to uh, minister deliverance. Then, if you come to uh, West Africa, some of the churches are trying to regulate them. But you can only regulate your own people. So what the churches can do is to cooperate with the government and see how the government will come into corporate. And when the government is coming to, into, some Christians are afraid that maybe the government may take it overboard and the government may come that would like to stamp the churches. So it has become a challenge. Um, but I think a dialogue between the churches and the government may help to curb the practices or the, the issue of uh, abuse. Thank you. Uh, in a sense, I emphasize the, the position of Dr. Charles Meng Larlen. Uh, he was a cutting edge you know, uh, medical uh, scientist. He, studied at Vienna with uh, uh, Freud and Carl Jung, and he accepted other address uh, theories. At the same time, he emphasized the theological interpretation of medical work. So I said, uh, this is a, uh, not just a chemical one, this is a social one, a colonial situation, and then you know, moral and spiritual one. So, uh, I, I think most uh, medical doctors, Christian doctors in Korea following this way in, in today's situation, uh, but some you know, uh, <laughs> uh, biased uh, ministers are practicing pseudo-scientific way of healing. That, that's a problem. And there, there are some abuse happens and uh, has happened a lot in, in, in South Korea in the past. Dr. Sanzana, do you have any? <laughs> Yo creo que, I think, in las iglesias, churches, eh, ecumenicas, ecumenical churches, oh, que son parte del, or those which are members, del movimiento ecumenico, from ecumenical movement, de alguna manera, somehow, orientan, orientate, 
a las diferentes iglesias different churches y gobiernos and governments para todo tipo de abuso uh, regarding every kind of abuse para el tema de salud in terms of health yo creo que el, el gran referente I think that the greatest, greatest reference fue como el Consejo Mundial it was how the World Council abogó uh, defendió defended la medicina psiquiátrica, psychiatric medicine, hmm. y eso nos puede ayudar, and that can help us para otro tipo de abuso, for other kind of abuses, a la hora de trabajar eh, when working salud. about health. Recuerden que tenemos una gran población, remember we have a great population con una serie de discapacidades, with a lot of disabilities, en las cuales in which por medio del evangelio, evangelion, podemos integrarlos a, a la vida we can add them or en abundancia. To life in abundance. Y el solo hecho de educar and the only, um, effect of educating a las iglesias the churches, llevó a integración to, to integration de este tipo de personas. This kind of people, eso eh, la integración de personas integration a nuestras comunidades to our communities en, en afecto in terms of affection un segundo paso es colocar orden to put some orders y puede ayudar el movimiento ecuménico uh, movement can help in that pero cada eh, país y cada eh, country iglesia tiene su propia realidad has its own reality Okay, thank you very much. We'll, that will wrap up our Q and A time. Thanks so much. So, thank you to our panelists, Dr. Poco Oniina, Dr. Elizabeth Salazar Sanzana, Dr. Sung Duke Oak, for such a stimulating discussion. Mm -hmm.